Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Greg Bendian, and uh, I'm so thrilled to have uh, just one of my favorite musicians, one of my favorite people, one of the most uh, engaging percussionists in the world with a voice all his own, very unique approach. We share a lot of the same interests. We have collaborated a bunch over the years. And uh, in fact, Alex uh, was the drummer on the first Interzone record and all the subsequent Interzone records. We also have a, a duet record together called His Spirit Two. Um, I was just looking and I, I realized that um, August 18th, 1996 was the date of the first uh, Interzone recording. Uh, and I have to say, uh, welcome to my buddy, Alex Klein. Hi, Alex. Good morning on this end of the country. Good afternoon to you. Yes. And uh, wherever people are in whatever time it is, where they are, where you all are out there in the cyber world. Hello. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, um, it's been a long, uh, a long and very, uh, very wonderful friendship. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, people might be interested in hearing a little bit about how, how we met, how we got to know each other. Mm -hmm. um, it, it actually goes back to a very early time. In fact, when I had just come on the scene uh, in New York, in 1983 and I was playing with uh, saxophonist Tim Byrne uh, just in a jamming situation at his place out in Brooklyn and he said to me you know I, I really I really like your playing you're a very dynamic player uh, you remind me a lot of a, a drummer named Alex Klein huh. and I didn't know who that was <laughs> uh -huh. but <clears throat> it stuck in my mind and then flash forward to probably t 10 or more years and uh, I was working with saxophonist Vinnie Golia and I said to Vinnie you know I, I, I've heard a lot about Alex Klein I'd really like to meet him and uh, does this sound like it's checking out so far and uh, oh, so good. and then we hung out uh, when I was in LA we hung out at your place in Culver City and it was immediate uh, how we sort of had so many things in common, so many common interests, so many uh, just good vibes, kind of began the eternal hang, you know? <laughs> uh, and yeah, I mean, do, any, uh, any recollection of that, of that time, Alex? Yeah, well, I remember when you came over and I remember I'd, I had heard the name Greg Bendy in a number of times, um, but I had not heard you play. Um, I was never very good at keeping up with all the current latest things going on in that sort of uh, new music scene because um, I always had just so many things on so many levels going on in my life simultaneously. But um, I remember when we met, it fi I finally realized I put the, the obvious piece together, which was, oh, he's the young white guy who played with Cecil Taylor. <laughs> 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 really? You know? And because um, I remember hearing about that because people would talk about that, you know, hey, have you heard this Cecil Taylor record, you know, in fluorescence, the drummer on it is this like young white guy. And I remember just being so kind of stunned and pleased by that because um, I kind of went through a similar situation with being in, a, in that kind of uh, that sort of drum chair when I was first being introduced to the sort of new music jazz world, when I was playing largely with African American musicians who had already established themselves as, as being important artists, and I was just this unknown West Coast, you know, long blonde haired white guy playing that music, um, which frankly, I'll say in all honesty, you know, made me, it was something I was very conscious of. I was very self-conscious about that. So that was one of those things that, um, one of the minor things perhaps that uh, made me instantly 
inst interested in you and your experience. Um, and of course, you know, once I heard you, then I realized, oh, you know, he's a very accomplished player. He's somebody who um, I could tell, like so many musicians who play that kind of music, or if we could say this kind of music, um, are in no way limited to being interested in or accomplished at playing that kind of music. You know, we had, we shared very broad interests in the very huge universe called music, you know. Um, and also as percussionists, being interested in a lot of different types of sounds that um, would augment our musical vocabularies. Um, this is another area that we, I, I think, were both very interested in and that we shared. But coming from different experiences and different um, expressions of that vocabulary. Yes. In <laughs> fact, uh, not surprisingly, uh, one of the first things I wanted to discuss, which you've already broached, mm -hmm. is our early similar experiences in, in playing with the African American, new jazz, avant jazz, whatever the hell you want to call it. Uh -huh. But it, 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 we also came from a, a rock background with an interest in, in prog rock and, and even uh, an interest in classical music and, and other things that it, I, I can speak for myself and, and I'd love to hear from you on this, which is um, I felt that, that the avant jazz or the, the, the new jazz that we were listening to and wanting to become a part of, the, the, the thrust of it was to bring in other things, to try bringing in your other interests into that music uh, and at the time, if you were lucky, you with Julius Hemphill and Vaikita mm -hmm. Carroll and Abdul Wadud, me with Cecil Taylor, Derek Bailey, these kinds of guys, they were up for that. They welcomed you to try to do something different. It was a built-in ethos to that kind of music, which made it all the more attractive to me. Uh, yes, well, um, we'll probably get into our various uh, and respective influences as we get more into this conversation. But, you know, for me, what was interesting was that I had not self-consciously tried to combine all of these influences and elements, <clears throat> excuse me, into what I was doing. It was just naturally who I was and what I was doing. And um, in a sense, this gave me an experience that was not only I learned later rare, but um, kind of uh, diluted me to a certain extent about um, how interested or tolerant some artists were of uh, uh, bringing in those sorts of elements into the music. So I was just really fortunate is the, the best way I can put it, which is that, um, which is because uh, I was playing with people who wanted what I did um, when I first played with Julius, it was in a trio setting with, with him and Vaikita Carroll here in Los Angeles. And I was 21 years old and people in this area were starting to know who I was and what I did, but outside of that, really not at all. And around that time, I had also begun playing with, uh, with Vinnie Golia and, um, John Carter and had been playing for a while with a, a local saxophonist named Jamil Shabaka, with whom I recorded what became my first recording, Duo Infinity. Um, and he and I were playing around town fairly frequently at the time. Uh, and um, the thing that really happened, it, it, to make it really simple, is that uh, the person who was putting on concerts at the Century City Playhouse at the time of this kind of music, uh, Lee Kaplan, who was an old friend from high school, and in fact, he used to play bass in the band with me and my brother Nels um, when we were in high school, <clears throat> recommended to Julius that he use me for this this concert that he was presenting because he asked Lee, from what I know, um, if he knew of any decent drummers uh, because he was doing this music for a trio, just saxophone, trumpet, and drums. 
and was coming to LA and wanted to know if there was anyone that he thought was up for the challenge. And so he recommended me and that's how that happened. The, the other short version of the story is that <clears throat> Julius really liked what I did. So we played the first concert here. Um, and then he invited me to go play three nights, uh, two to three sets a night up in the Berkeley slash Oakland area. I say that because the, the venue was Mapenzi, which was kind of right on the border of Berkeley and Oakland. Um, and it was from that experience, which by the way, is the first time I'd ever played out of town, um, that he invited me to do a European tour with him uh, that winter, uh, which required me going to New York to rehearse and uh, where we recorded an album as a trio that, that was never released. Sorry, That's what year, Al? 77, 1977. So, um, so anyway, that there are always like a, a million long and interesting stories attached to every aspect of what I'm, what I'm sharing here. But, um, but I think with the, the specific story I'd like to share related to this is before we went to New York to rehearse and record, we had a, a gig at the Foxhole in Philadelphia. So I flew with my gear, whole other story. Um, to Philadelphia and we played two nights as a quartet with uh, Julius Baikita and Abdul Wadud. Um, I had never played with Abdul. Uh, I'd never met Abdul. I'd seen him play, but that was it. And, um, and when we got there and got ready to play, I asked Julius, you know, what do you want to do? And he said, play. So we basically just improvised. And I just thought that was how it was. You know, I thought this is what these guys do. This is what I do. So I can fit into this. This is, this is fun. This is no problem. Um, and I only learned later that to experience that kind of trust, especially considering, you know, who I was and how unknown I was and how, what kind of a seemingly untested quantity I was, was really unusual. Um, but I experienced a lot of that. I was lucky to experience a lot of that with the people that I made music with. Um, so that allowed me to really not only develop what I was doing, but to contribute my particular identity to the music of whoever's gig it was. Um, and, you know, if, if, it, if they liked it, then all was well, you know, if they didn't, I suppose I wouldn't, I just wouldn't hear from them again. <laughs> Sure. But um, but that re that really never happened you know, until much later in my in my experience when it actually was playing with more what you might call straight ahead jazz guys. Then things got a little weird sometimes. But um, but maybe we can head into the influences thing here because I just my my mind went straight to some of the elements that um, I felt that I was trying to incorporate into what I was doing that had varying degrees of success, perhaps, depending on what the context was I was contributing to. Well, I, I just wanted to, to jump in on, on something you mentioned, which is the trust factor, and that uh, I experienced precisely the same situation mm. with the old masters like Derek and Cecil, uh -huh. where they're not going to say yes or yes, come play <laughs> if they aren't going to trust you to do what you want. Yeah. And this lack of um, direction or, or instruction or, uh, or verbalization, I have learned from, you know, doing about a hundred of, of these uh, Yale oral history of American music interviews Whenever I ask, what did you guys talk about before you did, you know, Jewel and the Lotus or, you know, Andrew, what did you talk about before you and instructors, one after the other, we didn't talk about it. Right. And what do you make of that? Because what I think is that the real, the real test or the real connection is not verbal, it's musical, it's sonic. 
Mm. Well, in the case of, of Julius and Baikita, it's interesting. Sometimes Baikita would make specific suggestions for some specific area in the music. Or um, if it was a piece of his, when we did occasionally play pieces of his, and actually I also played a whole concert of his music in San Francisco in 1978. Um, in, in the band was Julian Priester, Oliver Lake, and Michelle Rose Woman. And he would have he would make some specific suggestions, like maybe try playing that cowbell with a, with a maraca and play this part. I mean, that specific. That was unusual. Julius, on the other hand, never told me anything. Um, he told, would occasionally kind of do a vocal uh, interpretation of musical sounds later when we were doing the job band, like on a particular thing where he would say he didn't want me to just kind of play straight time. He would sing kind of what he wanted to hear. What would that sound like? Like that kind of a thing. So basically he didn't just want to hear ding, 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 or something. But I remember I would occasionally ask him questions like, you know, what is it you're really hearing here? What would you like me to do here? And he would say something like, well, whatever. So when we would play a tune like Sweet D, um, and I played this kind of, you know, Latinish thing on it, uh, you know, cross stick to snare down Tom Toms kind of a thing. Um, I just did it because that's what I was hearing in my head. And then if I would ask him, you know, is that working for you? He would just go. Yeah. So that was that. The only time I got any kind of direct feedback in the early, early experience with him was the first time we played Dogon AD as a trio. And I played that beat that Philip Wilson plays through the whole thing because that's what he does on the record. <laughs> so, right. So after the gig, Baikita said, you know, if, when we play Dogon, you don't have to play that beat the whole time. And I said, I thought that was the concept, <laughs> right? And he said, no, in fact, the only reason Philip played that beat and just stayed on it all the way through was because he couldn't play the tune any other way. And in fact, like he said, I'm the one who showed him that beat because, uh, it was a beat that he could basically keep going without losing the time. Mm. So after that, I was like, oh, okay. So then I could, I would play all over the place on it, but stay within that 11, eight time. And, um, and Julius just loved that, you know, because I guess that was not common, you know, but coming from the musical experience I did, you know, playing in an odd meter like that was n basically like nothing for me. That was like normal, you know. Um, That's interesting that, that you, you also bring up something in both of our cases where we followed somebody on a gig or we followed oh, someone yeah. on material. And we both had the experience of being white guys after groups were populated by black drummers. Now, mm -hmm. I had a slightly different experience in that in the months before Cecil called me to, to join the, the, the tr field trio, as it was called at the time, uh, the drummer before me was Tony Oxley. Oh. Wow. Once I knew that, and I think I had even seen Cecil with, with Oxley by that point. Mm -hmm. uh, once I realized that was on, it did give me a certain degree of freedom uh, mm -hmm. to feel comfortable in, in, let's just call it mixed bands. You know, I yeah. mean, we, we've had, uh, we've had both had a lot of experience playing in, in racially diverse ensembles, mm -hmm. which you know, it's funny because between reading the Miles book where he says the best bands are mixed bands or from uh, just the notion that we didn't grow up in music looking at race because it was, could you play? Uh, were you interesting? 
uh, you know, could you hang, all of these things. But the biggest, uh, the biggest issue in many ways was um, the critics were concerned yeah. about why aren't there black drummers in these bands? Uh -huh. Run into that at all? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, uh, first, I wanted to say that um, growing up as I did in Los Angeles um, and going to school in public schools here, um, I did have an experience uh, with ethnic diversity. So I was fortunate in that regard. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that I was free of being conditioned by what I'll call white body supremacy. So this is something I'm really trying to deconstruct in my consciousness now, you know, now that I'm in my 60s. Uh, but, um, but I was very conscious of the racial factor. As I said earlier, I think I was very self-conscious about that. Um, you know, the music that I grew up listening to and being really influenced by was pretty much all music made by white people up until I hit my teen years and became like a jazz guy. And one of the things that that did to me, which was a struggle for me for a long time, was um, it instilled in me and, and uh, sort of supported in me an inferiority complex. So I always felt that I was never going to be as good as, you know, my drum heroes. So like Tony Williams, Jack DeJohnette, Elvin Jones, Roy Haynes, Sunship Theus, you know, later. Uh, we, maybe we can get into him later too. But um, even though the drummers that I had been initially influenced by and wanted to try to play like, even though I couldn't at the time, were uh, almost all white British guys. But I, when I became aware of what was happening in real jazz music, uh, including in the avant-garde, I just felt like, you know, I'm always, I'm stuck. I'm always going to sound like a dorky white guy. And, you know, that was a struggle for me to, to get over. And one of the things that really helped me get over that was discovering that there was a lot of interesting drumming and music in general coming out of for lack of a better category, white people, largely in Europe. Um, uh, and Scandinavia enjoyed what they were doing enough to say, hey, you know, that's something else. OK, there, it's, you know, the guy can't play like Tony Williams, but what he is doing is really is great. It's really uh, exciting. So that kind of soothed that for me, um, eased that sense of frustration and futility that I felt in my early sort of attempts to become a jazz drummer. Well, yeah, because it's, it wasn't a problem for the guys we were working for. No. It was, um, it was internal. Yes, absolutely. Well, this is the thing. I've, I'm really blessed. I was totally accepted by Julius, by Baikita, by John Carter, by Bobby Bradford, and even by Horace Tapscott you know, before I got out of my mid twenties, you know, and I wasn't even, you know, my, in my own estimation, you know, I became a much better player much later. <laughs> so I don't know what they were hearing, but they, they, they liked something about it. Um, the one thing that I would say would sometimes create a division in the hang, since you mentioned the hang aspect is that Within these communities, there was always a, a very perceptible divide between basically the people who drank or did drugs and the people who didn't or didn't so much. Um, and as somebody who was ne never a drug user um, and who basically, uh, despite how freaky I looked in the early days, um, what it's, you know, one of the reasons I stopped looking that way is that everyone always assumed I was a complete druggie, but um, I've, oh, I've always been like the most like boring straight guy in the world, which for uh, as a jazz musician can create some strange mm -hmm. dynamics. Um, but to answer your other question about, you know, whether if this was ever a problem, and as you said, not with the musicians, it no, it wasn't, but, um, in the press, it was definitely 
sometimes very weird. So when I first played in Europe with Julius in 77, and, and, and then we went into 78 because uh, we started in December and left in late January. And I turned 22 while I was over there on that tour. Um, the reviews, which were all in other languages and which Julius would get translated for him, um, were almost entirely really negative when it came to me. And this really bothered Julius, but it, he, when he found out from some of the local writers and promoters that these people who had written these reviews had basically already made up their minds that I sucked because they didn't know who I was. I was a white guy and I was from LA. Um, he became really angry. I mean, he was really angry. And of course, part of it is because he thought he was doing me some kind of big favor, right? This is gonna, I'm, you know, he's gonna present me to the European jazz world. And, um, and it was, uh, it was very weird for me at the time. Um, and I understand that people have these preconceptions and these fixed ideas uh, about what's supposed to be what, but it's particularly weird, you know, coming from white Europeans. <laughs> uh, something that resurfaced later when we were playing together in the job band and I'm not I kid you not virtually every review of that band which for example in its peak in 1985 would have been Julius uh, my brother Nels Bill Frizzell Stuart Liebig and Juma Santos uh, and me virtually every review mentioned that it was quote Julius Hemphill and his mostly white band which is pretty hard to imagine being written in any kind of review in this part of the world. Which is incredible that you mentioned earlier that you heard about me as a young white guy playing in Cecil's band. Yeah, that's right. Now, but here's the thing. Was <laughs> that derogatory or was that, were people oh, cool? Were no, they cracking their heads? What, what, what is that? I think it was the novelty factor. You know, it's like Tony Oxley. People know who Tony Oxley is, and he does very well established himself in terms of what he does behind a, a drum set and a bunch of percussion instruments. But people didn't know you. Okay. So you were like this, oh, and you were an American guy, you know, East Coast. Um, I just think the anomaly factor, you know, the novelty factor was uh, remarkable to people. Um, I don't remember anybody passing judgment on your, how you sounded. Um, I think if they had thought that you were out of your depth or uh, inappropriately hired, I would have heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> Someone would have said something, you know. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, um, the funny thing too is with that record, Cecil, well, John Snyder, the producer, asked for solo pieces. And Cecil oh. didn't say anything. And I wound up with two solo percussion pieces on my first major record date. So not only is, it, is, it, is there another uh, sort of stamp of approval there, but people would get a chance to hear me bowing sheet metal and yeah, yeah. things with chains and, and right away, uh, no one in the band said anything about it. Uh -huh. I, I could take out at various objects and start clamping down cymbals and preparing the drum set and it was never discussed. So, you know, the fact that every time, and I also was badly reviewed. So, <laughs> so when the New York Times came to, to, to hear us at Lincoln Center for the whatever jazz festival, you know, I was, I was singled out. Uh -huh. It, this is not the most interesting topic for us to discuss. <laughs> it's something no. that, that I wanted to, to just sort of cover. And um, I guess I really wanted to talk a little bit more about how Julius put music together and what an interesting musician he was and, and, and really just how underappreciated he is in terms mm -hmm. of the new jazz and, and the, the, the 
the Black Artist Group coming out of St. Louis and the AACM coming out of Chicago. These were records that we were both buying, you in Los right. Angeles, me in, in New Jersey. And, uh, and they were having a huge impact on us. Mm -hmm. And I remember Dog on AD, and I remember that it was on Arista Novus. Yeah, well, I had the original version on Embari, which was Julius's label. But yes, and Coon Business was Coon Business, Arista. yeah. Yeah. We had Barry Altschul, who we probably haven't spoken about enough, but I know Altschul was an influence on me early me on. Me too. <laughs> yeah, although apparently Julius wasn't very happy with him on that. But, you know. but it opened up this world of, oh, it's a drum set with percussion. Yes. I remember that. I remember, oh, right. it's okay to have tuned cowbells. Oh, it's okay to have a bunch of wood yeah. blocks. Oh, it's okay to have metals, you know? Yes. Right. Well, that was a whole, that was part of that whole universe that opened up to me um, when I was discovering that, you know, it was going to be probably okay for me to never be a phenomenal African American jazz drummer. <laughs> right. Uh, um, I discovered that stuff when I was in high school and, um, you know, Barry Altschul was one of those people, but then there were people who were taking it much farther than that, mostly in Europe. We mentioned Tony Oxley, you know, I had heard him on Extrapolation by John McLaughlin and he was just playing jazz. And of course, then later with, even with Bill Evans, you know, um, and, uh, I was really impressed by him but then when i heard what he was doing with all the the added sounds and the live electronics which were of course very primitive at that time i mean i was just completely blown away by that um uh the first record of that so-called london improvisation scene that my brother nelson and i heard was the topography of the lungs um evan parker derek bailey and han benning right so um, we, when we first heard it, we didn't know what w was going on with it, you know, but we were fascinated by it. And ultimately after a while, you know, dabbled in trying to sort of play in that style sometimes, but, um, I don't remember speaking with Nels about Derek Bailey. Uh, well, I wouldn't say Derek was a big influence on him or anything, yeah. but, you know, also bear in mind that at the time, Nels was still very much engaged with, you know, trying to play like a legitimate jazz guitar player, you know. Um, he didn't start really fully taking it out till somewhat later. In fact, at the time, he was also focusing a lot of the time on acoustic guitar, so. Um, Finger style nylon string. Well, and steel string, you know, and then 12 string, you know, he still has the same 12 string, with Taylor 12 string that would now be worth a fortune uh, from the time when Taylor was a new company out of San Diego, I think. Um, but he was really influenced also by Ralph Towner and, you know, people like that. So, um, so I, the people that really, other than Tony Oxley, I started to hear that really had a, a, a major impact on me at the time. And as I say, I was still in high school. Um, one was, uh, Pierre Favre, the Swiss drummer, who um, I still consider, you know, one of the the greatest living percussionists. You know, I mean, he's like a true poet on the drums. And then the people, the person who wound up having a really huge influence on me, who's a name you don't hear very often, is Frank Perry, um, who was at the time playing in the trio and later uh, quartet Overy Lodge with Keith Tippett, pianist from England. And um, there's a whole story about how I first heard about Frank Perry. And, and ultimately, when the first Overy Lodge album came out, the trio one produced by Robert Fripp on British RCA, of all labels. Um, there is a fairly... stuff on British RCA too, right? The Sorry? Oh, yeah. Um, I th it's possible. I, I still have all those LPs. I should just pull them off the shelf. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting little run there, but sorry, continue. No, it's okay. I was just going to say that um, when I, I had been told about Frank 
um, by the same person I mentioned earlier, Lee Kaplan, who had gone to London and uh, met a lot of people. He was also very interested in the kind of prog rock scene. So he met some people over there, people who also worked at record companies and things. But he went to see Keith Tippett because, of course, of the connection at, between Keith Tippett and King Crimson. And they were playing, Overy Lodge had a, basically a residence, a residency at, uh, upstairs at Ronnie Scott's in London, where Frank's then considered massive setup of stuff was parked and where they would hold forth regularly. And he came back and told me the story about seeing this guy and talking to him briefly. I think he thought he was really out there. Uh, and when the Overy Lodge album came out, there's a fairly lengthy percussion solo on there of Frank's called Amethyst Gold and Royal Blue, my way of saying thank you. And when I heard that, it was one, just one of those moments. I mean, we all have these moments, I'm sure. Um, you know, for, for me, some of those moments were, you know, hearing Jimi Hendrix for the first time or hearing John Coltrane for the first time, or, you know, some of these things that were just landmark. And this was one of those landmark things. Um, somehow there was some part of me that identified so strongly with what he was doing and with the sounds involved that it was kind of a, uh, an assumption almost, not even an aspiration that, you know, I want to do that. I, that's it's like I'm already hearing it so I have to figure out how to make that happen and people used to and I started adding these different sounds to my drum set and things and people used to make jokes like you know pretty soon you're gonna have a setup like Frank Perry and I would laugh and say no way no uh -uh. <laughs> well I was wrong <laughs> I don't know that it was ever as complex as Frank's but, um, but still yeah that's the direction things went um, and, uh, you know, other people were doing interesting things that I learned about. So, I'm, you know, people like Paul Litton and Paul Lovins and, um, and we mentioned Han Benink and people who were uh, moving really far outside what we might consider the, the traditional parameters of improvised music and its vocabulary. And that was, that was exciting to me. I started putting various objects on my drums to get different sounds. Another person that um, became an influence at, at that time for me was Andrea Cintazzo, who was doing a lot of the similar kinds of things and with whom I met and played uh, in, starting in 1979 when he was on a tour, came to LA. Well, he would stay at your folks' house, right? Yeah. A lot of people stayed at my parents' house over the years. They, they used to make jokes about how they should put a plaque outside the house because it's, you know, I'll, I'm just going to try to talk off the top of my head for a moment. But yeah, Andrea, uh, George Lewis, Douglas Ewart, Burton Green, uh, Marty Ehrlich, Tim Byrne, um, Julius, Baikita. Um, those are a few. I'll just stop there. And, and as well and as Mr. That. Greg Bandian, of course. <laughs> Yeah, I, it was uh, it was always an honor to be included in that list of house days. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and your mom was was a gracious and and lovely host. Indeed. Well, you know, and going back to the days I'm talking about, you know, my dad was still alive then, and um, you know, he passed away in 1985. But um, you know. My my parents, in some interesting way, as I suppose, particularly from the kind of perspective of what we might call privileged white people living in a West Side LA neighborhood, were endlessly fascinated and entertained by the parade of people who would come through the house. You know, I mean, just um, not just all these jazz musicians of different ethnicities and backgrounds, but uh, you know, modern dancers and poets and you know all of these kind of eccentric colorful characters um they and this is really dug it. this is something that again you and i shared which is very supportive parents uh and, and i think in all 
four uh, cases, so my parents and your parents, um, cultured, educated people who were also teachers. Right, indeed. That's key. But yeah. then also the fact that um, my dad and mom appreciated jazz. Mm. So whenever there were jazzy characters around, <laughs> they were loving the person, the personas, the, the various um, characters. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there was a time, for example, when Vinny would almost every evening, he'd be over at the house hanging out. And uh, sometimes if he, you know, he would stay for dinner and then sometimes John Carter would come over, you know, he'd have this, this ritual where, you know, he would drink a can of Miller High Life after dinner because it was quote, good for his cholesterol. Um, and he'd drive over in his awesome Porsche SC, you know, a vintage Porsche. And we would just hang out in my parents' kitchen, you know, and talk about stuff. And, and um, when I had many of those musicians staying at my folks' house, Vinny would stop by and they would just all hang out, you know. Um, that, that was, and this is still, we're talking about the, the late 70s, you know. So um, very interesting experience because of what you said same deal um Nelsa's and my parents were really supportive of what we were doing even though you know on the most practical and security based level why you know <laughs> what was to support it seemed like complete um a sort of form of insanity in a way but um, in a way, that's that's white privilege, too. You know, I mean, one of the things that made it possible for me to play that music with those people was my own white privilege, because all of the African-American musicians I knew who were like my age in high school and with whom I'd met and would we would get together with Nelson, we'd all jam, as we would call it in those days. You know, they couldn't keep playing that music because they had to get out of their neighborhood. You know, they had to actually make something better out of their lives if they could so it was a luxury to and be able we know to the guys we loved many of them suffered very uh terribly for their art yes absolutely and sometimes adopted what i would say kind of sad strategies for making it work you know um but you know, it's partly because of that luxury of being able to make that choice that this whole trajectory of my life was able to uh, take shape. Because the other thing is, I never like sought any of the gigs that I ever played on. I never like lobbied or campaigned for any of it. You know, the people who just came to me, you know, there was word of mouth or, you know, there were, there was, it was quite a, a wonderful opportunity, but also a real honor to be able to, in a sense, be accepted and, and mentored by people like John Carter, Bobby Bradford, Horace Tapscott here in Los Angeles. I mean, these people, in my uh, estimation, are giants of the music, completely uh, irrespective of geography, you know? I mean, we all know that the jazz media is very East Coast centric and, you know, this historically been true for, for forever, probably. Um, but these were people who, for whatever reason, you know, came out and stayed in LA and um, were musical giants, really. Um, and they're uh, exemplary not only contributions but character really extended far beyond the their music um you know these were outstanding really uh, extraordinary people so i was really super fortunate uh, well i agree in fact um you're you're learning about being an individual by by watching them model this we're mm -hmm. learning about uh having a wide variety of interests i mean i've never met anyone as well read as cecil taylor uh just you know the bolshoi and the kabuki <laughs> right and, you know the you know archaeology and architecture and ballet so you know great role models too mm -hmm. but you could 
but I, and I think in a way it didn't compute to me that many of these guys were self-educated. Right. Because they didn't have the money to go to college. They didn't have the books. Right. Um, but that, that being said, I mean, at the same time, Pat Metheny told me that he was self-educated because he didn't really want to go to school because all he wanted to do was practice. But George Lewis and Pat Metheny both said, we knew there was a library. Uh, we to the library. We would read. We would we would improve ourselves. Right. So all of yeah. those those kinds of role models early on were huge for me. Yeah, for sure. Um, and you know, it's funny because let's say I was playing with Vinnie Golia through those years as well, and Vinnie is ten years older than I am, but he hadn't even been playing music as long as I had at that up to that point. Right. So I always considered him more of a peer than say a mentor. Right. And I would say that he considered the same people I considered mentors as being mentors. And I think they were, um, um, you know, the scene in LA for that kind of music, uh, has never been that big. Um, but it's always been perhaps because somebody theorized that it was partly because there was such a huge kind of roadblock known as, you know, the, intensely developed commercial music scene here and of course there was a very very heavy um busy studio scene through that period which doesn't exist anymore now but so there was always uh in a sense friction there was a potential roadblock there which was the omnipresent commercial music scene so some people have theorized that one of the reasons the uh, so-called more avant-garde scene here was so kind of de uh, dedicated was because there was that um, contrast, there was that obstacle, there was that thing to push against. Um, but you know, there's another thing too. I mean, what, one of the things that, so I, I'll just say off the, just right now, I never, imagined I'd still be living in Los Angeles. And here I am, you know, I've lived my whole life here. But one of the things that's afforded me to be able to do is going back to what we were talking about earlier, have, you know, a, a setup of instruments that's as vast as, you know, I seem to like it to be. Because, you know, I couldn't do that in New York, you know, I mean, everybody, all the drummers I know in New York, are, you know, like they, if they don't have, have to bring anything but a stick bag that's the way they'll go you know i mean that's reality that's just practical reality um so well could i just jump in yeah. uh the la scene was actually huge for me uh, because uh i think at a certain point i felt like an outsider in the new york scene for whatever reason doing what i did even within the avant-garde, which I won't go into tremendous detail, but I did feel welcomed mm. on the LA scene. Everyone wow. was very nice. Plus, there was a lot of interesting stuff going on. Yourself, Nels, uh, Vinnie Golia, all mm. the people we've been mentioning. And it was like a fresh, in a way, a fresh start, a fresh environment. Mm. And I also knew because I'm, I'm very aware of regionalism and, and the idea of regionalism as a plus, that regional, regionalism as a kind of forte for what develops in each area, you know, what develops in each part of England, what develops right. in each part of India. So knowing that there was a kind of LA improv scene, I thought was the most awesome thing. And I was also, you know, very much accepted by you guys. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I always felt, uh, like everybody had their values in the right place in terms of if you can play, if you're doing something unique, if you're doing your own thing, in a way, LA being a sort of underdog in this whole picture yeah, made that all possible because I viewed myself as an underdog and I came into a, a scene in LA to the point where, as you probably know, a lot of people asked me, are, are you an LA guy? Yeah. Same thing happened to Tim Byrne, exactly. He 
just couldn't get anywhere in New York. And of course, I think everybody perceived him just as, oh yeah, he's Julius Hemphill's student. And um, I met him through Julius, of course, because we rehearsed in Tim's Loft in Brooklyn. And he wanted to come out here and play some concerts. And he apparently was kind of reluctant to ask me if I would do it, but then he did. And I said, sure. Um, and that started a whole uh, relationship and a whole association that I think probably had a major impact on the first years of his music career. Um, because the other thing is that I, by uh, virtue of what you just described, you know, the scene here is just, it, it couldn't be as competitive right. as it was in New York, where everybody's vying for the same scraps, right? Um, and trying to get their names in the jazz press or whatever it is. And there's like a whole careerist sort of drive that really wasn't particularly required if you were making that music here. It's like you said, you're already an underdog. There's already basically nothing. There's not going to be any real money. There's not going to be instant you know, notoriety. And I think back on, for example, Arthur Blythe, you know, who, uh, and I, I was the drummer in his last band um, when he came back here. Um, you know, we remember when it, him when he was Black Arthur and you know, playing with, with Horace and people like that. And, um, and we mentioned Julius's album, Coon Business. He's on it as Black Arthur. That's the way he's named. Um, and we watched him go from, you know, the new kid to being like the Messiah, like so fast. And I remember Tim telling me a story about how he was uh, seeing a concert of Arthur's at one of the clubs in the village in New York. And how, I, I won't name the jazz critic that, you know, Tim was standing next to, but he said at the end of the first set, Arthur walked by this person and said, I got to talk to you which sounded quite ominous. And then he said, uh, you know, I like put my horn away, I'm coming back out. And he put his horn away and he came back out. And <clears throat> what Arthur wanted to talk to this guy about was, and, and, you know, I have to paraphrase, I wasn't there. This is, you know, Tim's story. But he basically said, you got to stop writing that stuff about me. And the stuff he was talking about was like how he's like the next Charlie Parker or he's, the new savior of modern jazz or, you know, these very hyperbolic, grandiose sorts of claims. I remember. Yeah. And, you know, cause then, you know, wow, where do you go from there? It's just, then that becomes a huge, it's like, you know, when you're a Hollywood star and you become hot, right? So becoming hot is a whole thing, but then staying hot is almost impossible. You know, after a while, you know, for one thing, we all get older and, Consequently, one of the other phenomena associated with that is that new, younger people come along and, you know, they move into your turf. So um, these are just realities that come with the territory. And, you know, for someone like me, I mean, I didn't do anything right in terms of, you know, having a career in this music. Um, and I won't say that there weren't times in my life where it was frustrating because I felt like, that, you know, we're doing this great stuff and no one pays attention or no one cares. Um, but after a while, it was just like, you know what? I mean, I made the choices I made and I know why I made them. They didn't all have to do with the music, for one thing. And, you know, why should I feel bad about choices that I made that I thought were the right choice? So, you know, I let that go a long time ago and fortunately I suffer a lot less now as a result. I remember uh, reading in Downbeat. I'm in high school. I'm, I'm learning about Cecil Taylor's music, studying with Steve McCall, studying with Andrew Sorrell. And there's an article about Cecil Taylor where he says, mm -hmm. never be ashamed of your influences. Ah. They nurture you. And that was it. That was a deal maker for me because I said, okay, great. I know what mine are. Uh, you know, you mentioned the transition from hearing, uh, you know, about a guy in the prog rock world who was in King Crimson and then moving into the improv world. Well, uh, you know, as you know, my experience 
was hearing this percussionist on Lark's Tongues in Aspic by King yeah. Crimson and Jamie Muir. Right. And I thought, this guy's really interesting. He's got a bunch of crazy stuff there. What is his setup? And I think we would see just a couple of black and white photos and just think, oh, that's really cool. So right. I followed him into the British improv scene where I didn't realize he had been discovered yeah. on an ECM record with Derek Bailey. Right. Music Improvisation Company. 1970. Uh-huh. Lark's is 72. So, you know, you have this, that's going on at the same time. And yeah. young enough, you're young enough, you're, you're impressionable enough that you just say, oh, this is all of the same piece. I mean, I'm not thinking King Crimson sells thousands more records than a music improv company, but I'm thinking, oh, you can play completely abstract stuff or you can put the completely abstract stuff on top of compositions. He's a free agent in that ensemble. I mean, there's a lot of free playing in, in, in that Crimson. Right. But, you know, you see he influences Bruford. So yeah. Bruford says, speaks well of Jamie Muir. So I'm thinking I'm a Bruford fan. Jamie Muir must have it going on. <laughs> Plus, you know, the, the funny thing about Frank Perry and, and Jamie Muir, contemporaneous on the scene, both played yeah. with guys from various parts of the British new music scene. Uh, but I could not identify any of Jamie's instruments. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so that attracted me too. just thinking, oh, you know, you could take a screen door and you can, you know, you can rub on it. And, yeah. You, know, you, you can, you can take bowls and, and pots and pans and all that stuff. That's, that's cool. And at yeah. the same time I was studying classical percussion and I realized, oh, Cage, Cage is doing that. Cage is taking <laughs> the mixing bowls. Uh, Age is asking you to set up kitchenware. Right. So it all seemed very valid to me. And right. I think that you talk about that moment where you're sort of not questioning that this is even viable and you're just immersed and just, it's a wonderful, I, I, I feel it was a wonderful moment in, in my life where yeah. there was no judgment. There, there was no concern about genre or boundaries or, Right. It's part of that moment. It's part of that time period. Yeah. But in my life to have lived in that time period where everything was on the table. Yeah. And you didn't have to worry. And, and then we got lucky because then we did that and we had some encouragement from the elders. Right. Right. You know, um, at what point did you start playing solo percussion? Because in my case, two things. One was pretty fast on you know within a few years of being playing with derek and and any zorn any of those guys i was doing solo percussion concerts uh -huh. and i remember one of the articles again in downbeat would be about the acm guys and and um and lester bowie said um muhal he says if you're going to be in the acm you got to do a solo concert Everybody's got to be able to play solo. You've got to be able to present yourself solo. And I remember that if I'm really valid as an instrumentalist, I have to be able to play solo. Huh. Isn't that okay. funny? Yeah. I hadn't heard that before. Um, just to back up to address some of the things you were talking about, which will lead into the solo question. Um, yeah, one of the things that was really interesting about getting into this music in the early 70s um, in high school was what you're describing, which is that, you know, it was all of interest and we weren't concerned about genre. Um, so, you know, for, for example, I would be listening to, you know, the Electric Miles stuff at the time, going back to uh, listening, you know, to, well, in a sense, there are these kind of big wide circles of kind of musical communities. So there was like the Miles Circle and there was the Coltrane Circle and which would include Pharaoh Sanders and McCoy Tyner and Elvin and all of that. Um, yeah, exactly. So you have um, those things going. And then, of course, then when we discovered the, the European improv thing, which, you know, I have to also say that Nelson and I thought that the 
what seemed to us the really limited vocabulary of that was kind of ridiculous. You know, we, we thought it was fascinating, but it was just kind of like, why do they have to limit themselves to just that? You know, it just didn't make sense to us. To me, free playing always meant that you could do anything, not just a particular kind of uh, thing that we, we value simply because it's, you know, free of idioms or whatever, but it becomes then its own idiom, which it is did. Just, and that was unfortunately limiting, but you realized it. So, so yeah. I, in fact, one of the reasons right. I was so into the LA scene when it, when it became available to me was everybody in New York was really concerned about it not sounding in any way idiomatic. Uh, so that it right. was very important to abandon and to, to make, you know, render verboten uh, certain <laughs> aspects of music making, right. particularly pulse. Yeah, yeah. Rhythmic playing uh, of a, of a di discernible thrust of pulse or, or even um, yeah. you know, rhythmic feel or modulation of rhythm. And, yeah. and so, um, you know, that's, that's so funny about, about that early, uh, that's 1970 and, and clearly it's very much a pushing away, yes. uh, you know, of an abandoning of right. vocabulary for a new uh, territory. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember once in an interview with Paul Motion, uh, the interviewer uh, was saying, you know, I went back and listened to all some of those early Keith Jarrett records you were on. And, and you know, at, at no time do I recall you ever playing any swing time. And Paul, as you know, had this amazing laugh. And he says, laughter. And he says, come on, man. You know, we were all trying to get away from that stuff. You know, of course I wasn't playing any swing. Of course, it's kind of funny. Then years later, they re-released some of that great Jared, American Quartet stuff. And there's a version of, um, what is that song? I think it's uh, Whoever Lives Laments. And Dewey takes this extended solo and Paul goes into playing swing through it. You know, it's hilarious. But anyway. But hey, um, Paul, we should just say. Yes. Huge. Huge. <laughs> Huge. So, so going back to what I was saying about, you know, all of these musical influences, we are also listening to the AACM stuff, but we are all also listening to um, ECM stuff, you know, in its early days, right? And listening to these European players and what's going on. I mean, all of this was happening at once. And the reason I mention this is because then when we would meet people, usually like press people or promoters or concert presenters, who were completely generally limited and even fixated on a particular genre or a, a particular style of playing, we just didn't understand this. And I think what wasn't understood by many of those non-musician people involved in the music or its presentation was that the musicians didn't have that limited view in any way. You know, all of the musicians I knew playing that kind of music had hugely broad interests as far as music and life goes, which you alluded to earlier when you mentioned Cecil. So a story that came to me was when I was on tour with Julius in 77, we're driving in a van with a gear to the next gig and the promoter who was Dutch was driving the, the van. And after a while, he was, it was dark and it was cold and he was bored and he basically needed to hear some music. And he said, did any of you guys bring any tapes or anything? And Julius said, no, he didn't have any. And Baikita said, yeah, I have three cassettes. So that dates it right there. <laughs> um, he said, let me get him out of my bag. And the promoter, who shall remain nameless, said, well, what are they? And he pulled them out and he held them up and he said, I have Heavy Weather by Weather Report, Fulfilling This First Finale by Stevie Wonder, and Marvin Gaye's Greatest Hits. And the promoter was horrified. He could not fathom this. He, said, he actually said something like, how can you even listen to that kind of music? And, and by Keita, it just was you know, like, what? And he said, well, have you heard any of these? And he's like, no. And he said, well, and how can you say that? This is great music. You need to hear this music. And he said, but really, Marvin Gaye? And then Julius kind of 
chimed in at that moment and said, this is almost exactly what he said, listen, if I could sing like Marvin Gaye, I would never have taken up the saxophone, right? So, which is the appropriate response. Yeah. <laughs> if so, I could sing like know, Marvin Gaye, I would never have played the drums. Yeah. So, you know, that encounter, this goes back in a sense to what you were asking earlier, that encounter with the people presenting that kind of music, having this really narrow focus and this really uh, kind of chauvinistic attitude about whatever genre or style they prefer was frequently an obstacle for the musicians themselves. But anyway, also, I wanted to go back and say that um, the AACM, since you've mentioned them, I mean, there was a place where I think the vocabulary was, it was welcome for the vocabulary to be huge. So you could just be playing toys, you could just be playing percussion, you could be playing, you know, doing screaming saxophones, or you could be playing swing, you could be playing time. You could be you writing could be uh, 12 tone. You right. Could, you could be or writing something totally tonal. Tonal, yeah. It was all good, you know, like the art ensemble. This was huge for me, yeah. right? So, um, so we were listening to all of that. So a lot of what that also includes is solo music, you know, that was becoming a, a more common forum for some kind of really exploratory musical expression. Um, for me, I started playing solo around that same time in the late 70s. And I, I'm sure part of it was uh, inspired by and supported by what was happening in the music elsewhere, because that is part of what was happening. But also it came out of, for me, kind of a need to present something where the sounds I was using were the focus. Because in some situations I found myself playing in, people wanted all those sounds, but frequently um, you couldn't really hear the subtlety of a lot of it. Wow. Um, they would easily get steamrollered by, you know, a, a bold saxophone moment or a dense ensemble moment. And um, I also wanted to point out that at that time I was playing in a trio called Spiral, which was an elect electric trio with Nels playing electric guitar and a synthesizer player, which of course was analog in those days. And what we did sounded you know, went from sounding like um, majestic orchestral space music and like when worlds collide, you know, I mean, it was, and it would run the gamut because there are also like a lot of ethnic instruments being used, bamboo flutes, percussion, all this stuff being pr played through processing, which of course by today's standards would be very primitive, but, um, dynamic level would go from super quiet to just insanely intense. So in many ways, what that group was doing, which is a group that I kind of led, I mean, it was, but we were improvising mainly, and the synthesizer player was a man named Brian Horner. Um, it had a lot in common with the music that I've been doing ever since on my own. So a lot of the same elements is just that when I do it, it tends to be mostly maybe you know more composed in most cases but um what the re i mentioned this because that means that even the type of music that i was listening to didn't even uh stay within the bounds of so-called jazz or the avant-garde or whatever like you mentioned um european classical music you know i mean during that my years in high school that was when i first heard messian for example I heard Tashi playing quartet for the end of time in person. Complete mind blow. That was another one of those moments where I just walked out going, you know, my life will never be the same after this. Um, listening to a lot of music from different cultures, right? African music, explore. Gamelan music, you know, um, Gagaku music, whatever, you know, all of these things were, and my, and my brother was always heavily influenced by Indian music. I mean, Ravi Shankar was one of his, 
first big influences when he was 10 or 11 years old. So um, <clears throat> this, no, this includes rock music too. And the thing that I wanted to emphasize is, and this is one of the things that created maybe of a distortion for both me and Nels, which was there was so much of the music we were listening to in any of these genres that incorporated free improvisation. So we thought that was like normal. Right. You know, somewhat naive, perhaps. But even like you said, King Crimson, you know, I saw that that band with the, the quartet version with Bill Bruford and that that bunch uh, three times. And particularly the first couple of concerts, one really particularly memorable one being the second one at the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium. I would say that easily a third of the concert was improvised. We were really influenced by the group Oregon. And Oregon, when you know, they would connect their compositions by doing free improvisation. Um, and then there were the people we'd go to hear who were really very much, pretty much fully concentrated on free improvisation. And of course, the kind of music that we're talking about where improvisation was, you know, one of the, the main features. So <clears throat> that was a common denominator for us in all of this. And the other thing, the last thing I want to say before I go into the solo thing more is, unlike you, uh, my musical education is, is almost, I, I would say minimal, but it's probably smaller than minimal. So most of my musical education comes from actually playing. Um, I am not entirely self-taught, um, although I had been playing for quite a while before I ever had really decent drum lessons. Um, I had about two years of drum lessons when I was in high school because I got into the high school stage band through a series of very, very bizarre circumstances, <clears throat> um, talked into it by a guy who was the, the other guitarist in our rock band that we had in junior high school. The band was called Toe Queen Love, by the way, um, who was in the stage band and said, you can do it. Come on. We need a drummer. We need you. And like a fool, I said, okay, what the heck? I'll rearrange my schedule and I'll join the stage band. I was in the you know, 10th grade. That was the beginning of high school in those days. And so I got into this band and I couldn't read and I couldn't play swing. And that led to a need to take drum lessons. So I had about two years worth of drum lessons and that's the sum total of my official musical education. Everything else is stuff I quote taught myself, you could say. But I think the ear is the best learning tool. Mm. You know, I mean, um, obviously I, I care about <clears throat> uh, pedagogy and, and having a method and having a numerical system and all these things, they're useful. But yeah. if you don't have the ear, it's not gonna go anywhere anyway. And so uh, the vast majority of people, I mean, we could name anyone like Alan Holdsworth to, to you know, uh, I don't know, but but guys who don't, who didn't really look at it in terms of, I have to study theory. Right. And I think that you, you know, but I, I was, wanted to find out, were you guys, when you mentioned uh, hearing world music, as it were, uh, were these the None Such Explorer series? Oh, for sure. And, and others. Yeah. But yeah, oh, like, right. I mean, None Such Explorer, for sure. You know, those famous you know, Balinese gamelan recordings, some incredible Tibetan Buddhist ritual music recordings, all of that stuff. Yeah, for sure. And I know the Eastern world has been important to you. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, right. philosophically, but yeah. then also, you know, uh, just the, the arrangement of, uh, you know, the, the, this, this range of, of sounds that you're interested in including uh, prayer bells and, and, and bowls and, and metal and gongs and, and ringing things. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's a transition in, in <clears throat> talking a little bit about solo. Right. Yeah, that's where a lot of the solo impetus came from, was from, <clears throat> excuse me, my relationship with those instruments and those sounds. Because um, those are the kinds of sounds that would not always... Um, their presence would not always uh, make for much of a contribution in, the, in a, a context where there was more density and more intensity. Um, I would say that, you know, combining that influence that I mentioned earlier of Frank Perry, which was very focused on those, that, that sound world, 
and then the incredible you know, rhythmic intensity and technical uh, facility of someone like Sonship Theus, who was local and who I could go here play regularly. You know, I used to even sometimes like show up early and carry, help him carry his drums. And, and um, you know, and that was another one of those moments. And you had friends who were friends of his and they used to tell us these amazing stories about him. And then when I went to uh, a concert with our friend Michael Preussner, uh, because he wanted us to hear Ndugu Chancellor playing with Henry Franklin's band because he had heard Ndugu with Alice Coltrane and said, you got to hear this guy. And we went and sure enough, it was actually Sonship playing drums, not Ndugu. And hearing Sonship for the first time at that concert was one of those moments for me. It was like I, I not only identified so strongly with what he was doing and, you know, admittedly he had the the you know, the fluorescent paint splattered equipment with the black lights on the bass drum with the message, you are a creator written on it with a hole cut in the head with a little styrofoam globe that would bob in and out. <clears throat> and he had his hair done a la, are you experienced, you know, glitter in his hair, uh, platform boots with paint splattered on them, you know, long fingernails with black nail polish. It was, you know, it was an encounter for sure. But I remember after the first set, I felt, you know, I suppose to a drug user, they'd say, you know, that I, I was high, right? But I just felt like every cell in my body had been lit up. That I, I felt in a kind of, uh, I had an awareness of, uh, of an intensity of life force or energy that was completely, um, extraordinary for me at the time. Um, the similar experience I had was that when I went by myself not long before that and heard Pharaoh Sanders band at Royce Hall at UCLA op with the opening band being the Michael White Quartet. Oh. And I remember just, you know, that's a whole other story, but I walked out of there just like, I felt like I had been spiritually awakened. It was one of those things. So, um, so the dynamic range that we're talking about is really huge. And in fact, I will say that going back to the kind of the critics question, I mean, one thing that I would frequently get hit on was that I played too loud. You know, this was one of the things that was pretty common. Um, and you'll you know, appreciate this. One of the things that would often get said was I had, I, I had what could be described as a more East Coast approach, which meant more aggressive, I guess. But, but this also brings to mind something you brought up earlier, which is that uh, you were saying, you know, regional uh, considerations. One of the things that I realized later that I think is really great about, that I can feel good about regarding being a, you know, a, a Los Angeles jazz musician is that one of the characteristics of so-called West Coast jazz starting in the 50s was a, a much more intensive and blatant exploration of different sorts of instruments and different orchestrational approaches to the music. So flutes, you know, I mean, flutes people take for granted now. This was like a huge contribution of West Coast jazz. You had people like Buddy Collette, with whom I played, um, Paul Horn, you know, all these guys, Charles Lloyd, you know, he was at USC and started here. Um, all of these guys, not to mention things like double reeds and, you know, groups in different configurations. And this brings us right up to into the Shelley Mann territory, but I, I don't think we have time to talk about everything. But I would recommend to anyone who's never heard it that they check out the album recorded in the 50s called The Three and the Two. And I'll just leave it at that. You know, Shelley also, you know, later became somebody who I like hugely revered and uh, felt a certain amount of comfort from because he was a white jazz drummer and a, a brilliant player and actually a real innovator in terms of um, his milieu. 
But anyway, I'm, I haven't gotten more into the solo thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> Before you do, though, I want to say, I, I think you were the person that turned me on to how amazing Shelley Mann was. Uh, the three and the two, incredible. Yeah. Uh, and also early, early free improvisation from another place. So, I mean, those guys were doing composition, improvisation, blends, yeah. very early Shorty Rogers. Yes. Now that's LA stuff. That's not New York stuff. Right. Very European compositional influence um, in a lot of those people. But yes, in, indeed, not just the improvising, but the compositions and the orchestrations. And I, people would say that it, they would do that because they felt more freedom here to do it, to try it. Um, they, particularly during that period, a lot of those musicians <clears throat> would say that they felt a lot of pressure on the East Coast to be more like, the, you know, to uh, conform to the hard bop sort of style that had been developing and it was prominent by then. And out here they could you know, basically, uh, to use a, a maybe an unfortunate word, relax and uh, investigate some other ways of doing things. And I, I think that, you know, the contribution of the people in the AACM and some of these European uh, communities of playing solo, it, it fits into that, you know. Um, if you have the space in which to explore that, chances are they're going to get, the chances are going to increase that you're going to maybe check that out. Um, and for me, having the space to not only explore it musically, but just in terms of you know, I mean, when I think back on how frequently I lugged around this huge setup of stuff, I mean, it seems a little more than a little crazy. Um, but that was what I considered to be, you know, my voice, if you will. I was once asked in an interview on the radio, you know, well, Alex, why is it they use this big setup of all these instruments when you can go hear someone like Billy Higgins and he's got two cymbals and a four piece drum set? And, you know, I don't remember my exact answer, but it was something along the lines of, well, I suppose if Billy Higgins was hearing, you know, a bunch of bells and gongs and different sounds in, uh, in his head that he wanted to manifest in the music, then he would incorporate those into his setup. But, you know, it, it's putting a, a value judgment on something. And to me, it suggests that if you have all that stuff, you're, you know, you're compensating for something. Um, certainly, in the more recent jazz world, things have much more commonly returned to the most basic elements. You know, you see a lot more guys now with two cymbals and a four piece drum set. But um, a lot of that is practical. It's a lot of it's logistical. I mean, these tend to be New York guys, you know. I, what would I do if I were in New York? I wouldn't be lugging a big drum set. Well, actually, I should be honest. My big, biggest setup barely ever leaves the house anymore because there's just not, there's no uh, justification for it, you know. I think it should be said that you were, first of all, we all choose our palette. Mm -hmm. choose our vocabulary uh, and there wouldn't have been other ways of making those sounds apart from now where if you wanted to program them into a, a, a keyboard and sample them and it's right. the same thing because vibration is a big part of what you're doing and physically feeling the vibration of those metals and the way they resonate and the way they resonate with each other you know uh there's no substitute for that. So, you know, you were kind of, I, I often feel like I had the same thing with the vibraphone. I mean, flying a vibraphone around. Right. You know, right. you're committed. You're going to suffer for that. But what are you going to do? Play a mallet cat? I yeah, mean, yeah. It was suggested to me, but I never really jumped because it yeah. didn't have the same, you know, um, tactile it didn't have the same resonance. It didn't have the same expression possibilities, you know, all the different ways of striking. Yeah. And right. so, you know, you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't, but you're certainly going to, going to have your vocabulary, which I know is the Alex Klein vocabulary. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, we'd be doing a, a record um, 
and I'd say, can you bring, bring some gongs? Can you bring this? Can you bring that? And so it's a really nice option. And then we had the luxury of recording in your music room for a spirit two where you oh, yeah. have your entire setup. Right. Right. And I do gigs these days on a, on a tiny little drum set sometimes, although <laughs> people still kind of make fun of me because I'll have this thing you know, this little, four piece drum set and then I'll have, you know, four or five cymbals, right? Instead of say two. Um, but that's who I am, you know? Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to say that I just thought of is that, you know, when I was talking about the craziness of lugging this big setup around, um, it wasn't uncommon during that time. I mean, it wasn't common either, but there are a number of people who are doing these percussion sorts of things with a lot of equipment and some of them were the people who were really influencing me so you know, like i mentioned frank i mentioned pierre Favre, people like that um and i was the kind of person who you know a record would come out and it would be a picture of a guy sitting in the middle of a mass of stuff and i would have to buy it you know um there were people doing that uh you don't see much of it anymore but that's, uh, that's just the way the music has gone. It was a different time. I remember. <laughs> they weren't all good records either. I mean, oh. sometimes they were really disappointing, but... Um, but the but classical the world, out. you know, the, the classical world I was inhabiting part-time <clears throat> was a huge percussion world. Right. I remember hearing the percussion de Strasbourg at uh, Poly Pavilion playing um, that Zanakis piece. We've talked about this, you know, yeah. where they're all playing in different tempos and everything. And then it all comes together and then... Safa, yeah. Yeah. Safa and Persifasa, yeah. All of that stuff, you know, I was completely obsessed with all of those sounds. And at the time, of course, couldn't afford to buy most of them, you know. Um, I was, because we were preparing for this interview and I discovered that somebody had actually downloaded my solo percussion album on YouTube from vinyl. Not alone. Um, I listened, I was kind of needle dropped through some of it because I, I never actually felt like, I was never happy with most of that record. And um, Glenn Kochi of Wilco loves that record and he would always tell me, you should go back and listen to it. You're wrong, you know? and one of the things that struck me about it as I was needle dropping through it was how many of the sounds that I was using then, as opposed to in more recent years, were just found objects. They were just junky things that um, I found in all kinds of places. Also, people would give me stuff. You know, yeah. they'd hear me play and they would say, hey, I have this great, this great chunks of aluminum that sound really cool, you want them, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I had a lot of stuff, but a lot of it was, you know, stuff that most people would throw away. It wasn't like I was, it was before I, you know, got an endorsement with Beiste, for example. Well, so what year is Not Alone? Uh, I believe it was recorded in 81 and it came out in 82. And when did you get with Paiste? 85. Actually, I started using their stuff before that, but I got it, I, I you know, became an endorsee in 85, although for a while I was only an endorsee in Europe. Right. Um, because I didn't really qualify for the, the rare, vaunted American endorsee status. Um, and at the time I was playing, I was touring in Europe with people like Julius and Tim and Vinny, so. And it's a um, European company, we should say. Yeah, Swiss. So, so I would get stuff over there and then have to like, you know, drag it over here. I'd visit the factory, always a stunning and wonderful experience. But, um, but it wasn't until then that I was able to actually start getting some really good gongs and stuff. And I have to say, if we're gonna talk about gear, change, making that change in my, in my gear, as far as cymbals go, it actually really changed the way I play it. Um, 
changed the way I was hearing the symbols and the music. It changed my touch. Between that and um, suffering some injuries that were not music related, um, I had to make some really big, uh, let's just say alterations in my physical approach to the instrument. And unfortunately sounded frustratingly not up to the level I wanted to for many years because of those, those injuries, including the time when I was playing in injury zone. You know, I was still struggling with some technical issues during that time, <clears throat> which for whatever reason don't appear to be issues anymore. Um, Are you had is wrist issues? Right wrist, I tore ligaments in my right wrist and I also in a car accident tore ligaments in my right ankle at one point. Um, the wrist was by far the hardest thing to deal with, especially since I'm right-handed, you know. I, did, I actually did a whole tour with the jaw band where my wrist was taped up and uh, I had a brace on it and I couldn't even play a role. I remember. You know, it was like that. <clears throat> but that was the last jaw band tour in 86, um, which had Alan Jaffe on guitar. Now, I wanted to ask you about this, though. Um, the, the Alex Klein Ensemble. Uh -huh. I always felt like the Alex Klein Ensemble, and I, and I still feel this way, was sort of the perfect amalgam of all your worlds. Ah, uh, <laughs> well, that would make sense, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> so you have done it. <laughs> Where it's got all of your beautiful ringing uh, metal sounds and, and soundscapes of, of, of uh, Eastern bells and, and, and all sorts of beautiful, colorful, metallic ringing sounds. And then it has your, your interest in space and, and, and orchestrating the, the uh, ensemble. It has your melodic interests. It has your, your complete... Uh, organizational skill of how you're going to deal with a larger ensemble. Because I always think of, of the Alice Klein ensemble as a chamber kind of ensemble. Is that, is that fair? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it was actually while I was touring with the Tim Byrne Quartet, the Fulton Street Mall Quartet, that I resolved that I needed to finally record my group music. So I had never done anything as a band leader of just playing my music um, uh, until that point. I had written some pieces for quartet music, which for people who don't know is my brother Nels, Eric Von Essen, Jeff Gautier, and me, um, which was a group that concertized extensively for about 11 years, but um, unfortunately only recorded very little. Uh, much of the repertoire never got documented, uh, unfortunately. Most of it being by Eric Von Essen, the late Eric Von Essen. But a beautiful um, sort of chamber jazz ensemble, acoustic instruments. Yes, right. I had to, I devised a completely different drum set for that group. But, um, but yeah, that first project of my own music, which was the Lamp and the Star, which ultimately came out on ECM Records, um, was very much, it was in a way it was informed by the same sorts of uh, influences and needs that the solo playing did, which is I need to manifest the music I'm hearing um, where I can allow that kind of space that you described, those sounds to be more at the forefront rather than somehow in the way in the background um and to uh to you know express myself musically which is i guess why people do these things um it wasn't intended to become a group uh it became a group after the lamp and the star came out and um unfortunately we had very few opportunities to ever play live but we did so that that group was ina kimanis was the vocalist jeff gautier on violin Eric Von Essen originally on bass, um, later Michael Elizondo was the bass player, um, Wayne Pete on keyboards, and then later G.E. Stinson on electric guitar. So <clears throat> uh, 
Um, having a group like that is very impractical. Uh, it was really hard to find a proper venue in which to play. Also, the dynamic level is an issue. Um, having a sound system, you know, where we can all hear each other and we can hear the voice. Um, and where there's room on the stage for me and all my stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's a very gear intensive group. Uh, so, um, we were together for a long time. I think something like 12 years, but uh, didn't get to play very often. Like five albums? Well, the, 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 there are only, I mean, if you want to think of them as that basic lineup's work, yeah, there were four. So there's The Lamp and the Star. The second was Montsalvat, which came out on Nine Winds after I tried to shop it for five years. And uh, the two on cryptogramophone, which are actually kind of, you know, brother and sister, sibling related projects that I had originally conceived to be a double CD. Right. And then for many practical reasons did not do that way. But that's why they look similar. One's black, one's white. One is just the group. And then the other is the group plus guests. Um, that's Sparks Fly Upward and The Constant Flame. And then we actually recorded The Constant Flame uh, at a time when I knew that it was going to be the last thing the group ever did because <clears throat> uh, Michael, the bass player, was already on salary with Dr. Dre doing uh, tr backing tracks, composing tracks for him. That's why Dr. Dre is one of the people thanked in the special thanks because Michael had to get released from his, uh, he was, because he was, you know, on salary, he has to be on call 24 seven and he had to get permission to do the, re the two rehearsals and the two days in the studio to do. The are you record. allowed, are, are we allowed to do hip hop and free jazz? I don't, is that even allowed? <laughs> <laughs> and then Ina had basically already announced to me that she was going to give up performing. Why? Um, well, you'll have to ask her. Uh, okay. But I, I love her, her voice on your stuff. I love the, the notion of that voice sitting in the middle of all of the different s settings yeah. that you have with that ensemble from, from completely stark to completely crazy. Um, yeah. What, what well, an amazing musical relationship. I mean, can you say a few things about her? Sure. I mean, I will say that it was um, very difficult for her to be that much of the focus in the music. She was much more comfortable being kind of blended in with everything. Um, so she was very exposed. I think she felt very exposed, which was very nerve wracking for her much of the time. Where did you find her? Well, uh, okay. <clears throat> I was always a big fan of and was very influenced by Bar Phillips. Um, one of my all-time favorite records is Mountain Escapes by Bar Phillips. And I loved, speaking of solo music, his solo bass stuff, some of the best ever on any instrument. So <clears throat> when, you know, being one of those people who followed ECM releases religiously during those many now ancient years ago, um, when the Bar Phillips album Journal Violone 2 came out, which was a trio with John Sermon and Ina Kimanis. Um, well, I'll back up a bit. I always had this weird kind of situation with Barr and his music where, for example, I had had this idea because, for example, I was playing with Vinny at the same time I was doing my group Spiral, that you know it would be interesting to do a project sometime where those two worlds came together, right? electronic kind of space music and free jazz. And then Mountainscapes came out, which is basically that, you know, and I just blew my mind. And it was so well done for, to me, even though apparently it was a very difficult session for many reasons. But um, I was just really blown away by that, the success of that, and how beautiful and how well it was done. So then when Journal Violone 2 came out, it's a similar thing. I had this sound in my head and I realized that 
the sound in my head was a, 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 a woman's voice, a, a female vocalist. I think part of the inspiration to that, for, for that may have come from those tracks with Asha Putli on <laughs> Science Fiction by Ornette Coleman. You know, I loved those tracks. <clears throat> but I, what I can't say that for sure. Can right. I give? And then I also loved Julie Tippett's and the, the stuff with Keith Tippett. So anyway, but I had this particular sound in my head. And it was one of these things. I went out and got Journal Violone 2 when it came out. I thought, saw it had a female vocalist. I was surprised by that. Just a trio. And I put it on and her voice was the sound I had in my head. It freaked me out. I was just like, who is this person? This is the sound. This is exactly what I was hearing. I assumed she was, you know, a European for many reasons. One, Barr lives in France, ECM is European, her name is Ina Kimanis. I mean, she looked European, she had the style, you know. So when I was on that tour with Tim Byrne and I was structuring what I wanted to do on my own record as kind of a band leader composer, uh, it didn't have a voice or on it originally because I had given up on that idea. I had worked with or met various vocalists over a period of years and nobody fit the bill for me. Nothing against them, but number one, they didn't have that. They usually had either a more classical sound or a very unpolished sound. They couldn't be counted on to sing in tune maybe. Um, and they couldn't improvise frequently or they weren't comfortable doing it. So I was talking, we were in a train station and I was talking to Bill Frizzell and he wanted to know what I was, you know, wanting to do. I only remember how the topic came up and I described it. And then I just said, as a kind of a, a, a coda to my description, I said, you know, I actually always wanted to have a female voice in my music, but I could never meet the right person. I never, uh, found the right person to fit the, who fit the bill. And he asked me if I could get anybody on the face of the earth, who would I get? And I said, Ina Kimanis. And he, in his typical bill sort of way said, Ina Kimanis? I said, yeah, you know, she did some records with Bar Phillips because she was then on his the record that came after Jean Alvey one and two called Music By, which unfortunately I think is out of print and has Pierre on drums. Fantastic. And um, he said, and this is maybe not all verbatim, but he said, you know, she lives in Berkeley. I said, Berkeley, California? He said, yeah. Um, he started pulling this thing out of his bag. He said, do you know Hans Wendel? I said, yeah, I know who he is. He said, that's his wife, which she was then. She hasn't been for a long time now. But, and I said, do you think she'd be into doing something? And he said, just ask. And he wrote down, her phone number and address. So long story short, when I got back and started really planning this whole thing, I contacted her and, you know, I think she was a little reticent at first, but fortunately Hans was a big fan of Fulton Street Mall and other things that I had done. And she agreed to do it. And that's what started it. So subsequent projects, um, including some concerts down here. Um, she would come down and she'd stay in our tiny little apartment that Karen and I had then. And um, that's that, you know. So when she announced that she was basically going to retire from music, um, she had already committed to doing the Constant Flame. And I had to kind of remind her 
that this was coming up and that you had agreed to do it. So I knew and she knew going into it that this was going to be the last thing that we did. And I knew it was going to be the last thing that group would ever do. Um, and that's why the last piece on the CD uh, is dedicated to her. It's an incredible piece. It's an incredible ensemble. Um, those recordings stand as, as something very unique mm -hmm. in, in this kind of musical world that we live in. Um, and I'm, I'm never uh, more surprised by the, the range of your musicality than in the, the, the Alex Klein ensemble. I mean, obviously I know all the different things that you do, but uh, you know, hearing you, hear, being able to hear the Miss Anne influence exist in that kind of setting. Blatantly uh, at times. <laughs> yeah, but I'm even like Lifetime being an influence oh. at, in times and uh -huh. you know, Wayne on organ or, you know, just, Again, the, the fulfillment of this promise we were given by our elders that you can put in whatever you want and yeah. you can make it yourself and make it your okay. own. Um, and I, before, before we split, I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Interzone because it's 25 years ago mm -hmm. that we met and it's 25 years ago that we started the first Interzone, which was not the one that made the first record. Right. You know? And as you recall, uh, we both played drums at certain points in the first version before I realized, you know, I want to play vibraphone and let Alex handle all the drumming. Because I realized that if I was going to play just vibraphone, the drummer that I needed, the percussionist that I needed to be there with me was Alex Klein. Uh -huh. Weirdly, I've played in a lot of duos with other drummers. Um, I don't know why, but you know, that's been fun. I haven't done it in a while, but. but it's not easy to do I mean, if there's not some sort of simpatico. Oh, it can be a nightmare. A nightmare, right. Yeah, yeah, I've had good luck with the double drumming thing. Um, I also wanna mention, speaking of the double drumming thing, because one of the pit things I did in a duo with a drummer was playing with Peter Erskine who produced those two uh, yeah. Alex Klein ensemble records on cryptogramophone. Um, and I have to say that that was profound because number one, I just, I felt at least that night totally unprepared for um, what I was doing, but also because, you know, people talk about how, you know, drummers have a particular groove or a deep pocket or, you know, all of these kind of cliches. But as drummers, we don't ever get to experience what that's like. Um, you know, we're not a bass player, we're not a horn player, or a guitarist, or whatever. But I experienced it playing with Peter. That was one of those things where I felt like, wow, man, no wonder people want to play with this guy. You know, the groove was so deep and so, um, it wasn't even that it was comfortable, it was because in a sense it was still so propulsive. It isn't like you could just kind of lay it down in it and fall asleep. Um, but I just thought, you know, yeah, if I were playing another instrument, I would have to have that, you know. Um, I wasn't able to really successfully get into that groove at the time. Um, I was pretty intimidated, frankly. Um, but I will say that as just as an aside, that after I became a parent, um, which was, you know, about 16 years ago now, and couldn't practice anymore, didn't have time, you know, was working my part-time day job, playing gigs still, very sleep deprived for an extended period of time. Um, and like I said, I couldn't practice anymore. My playing improved. And part of what improved was that groove thing, you know. Um, and I, part of it has to do with relaxing, but a lot of it has to do with getting out of your head. Um, I did go through a period of a number of years where I felt like I was so mm, micromanaging of my own time and my own 
placement of the time and my own, what I felt to be um, combination with, say, the bass player and all those jazz things that people can obsess on. I was obsessing on. I got way too into my head and it got so bad and I was also having some of those technical frustrations I described earlier, I was really thinking, well, you know, maybe I just need to quit. This is just not fun anymore. It's, it's driving me nuts. So I went and had a conversation with Peter. <clears throat> and he was hugely helpful. And one of the things he did for me, and this also goes back to something that we hit on earlier, is he gave me a mantra. Have I ever told you this story? No. Okay. Here's what his mantra was. He said, when you get into that place, this is your mantra. You have to remember your mantra. Paul motion. Well, you know, that helped a lot because the, sure. the point is just have fun and play. Just make music. It has nothing to do with technique. It has nothing to do with all of these you know, supposedly musical considerations that people obsess about. And, and I just stopped thinking about it. I would just play and then it was fine. Right. I mean, even when I was really tired and I knew that physically I was going to have challenges just having the energy to get through like two sets of music, I by then so valued the experience and it was so precious and so enjoyable to just play that my playing improved. So playing in interzone, um, I think, you know, I was always frustrated in, only in that my playing was still not at the level technically where I wanted it to be. Um, but, you know, musically, it's like so many things I've done where that broad experience of music, you know, genre defying um, universe of music was what was being explored. So it, I didn't have to, you know, worry about if I was convincing or not. You know what I mean? And this is what happens in more idiomatic settings, you know, like people have expectations, you know, they want to know if you're going to be able to swing convincingly or play funk convincingly or, you know, slam the backbeat convincingly, whatever it is. And this wasn't about any of those things, right? Because this is coming up for out of this very large universe musically. Um, uh, some of which was sound, pure sound. Some of it was, you know, swing. And, you know, and it's a band that I believe went through like eight bass players <laughs> at various times. Um, but, but the importance of having you and Nels together uh, in a group where it wasn't really your material, but I was writing specifically for you guys and also writing specifically for things I knew you guys would be comfortable at. Yeah. And, um, so it was, I had learned that Ellington thing pretty early, which is, you know, you write for the guys that you're writing for and you will have a better, uh, more, I think a more kind of fulsome, but, but even a more organic uh, experience of your music being presented the way you want. And, and knowing you and Nels were basically kind of like a unimind situation. Yeah. I asked him after I had already asked you. So, so he right. was really, um, coming in after you had been established as the drummer and, and percussionist in Interzone. And it was, again, like the most natural fold in you could possibly imagine. Like, you know, every, we all listen to the same records. We all, yeah. you know, what about that sound? You know, that sound, uh, you know, that guitar yeah. sound. So I started writing for Nell's pedal setup, you know, and including his, yeah. his sounds and including your, your sounds. And then, of course, the, the music would change within the, you know, a, a program of music. So we'd have the swing, we'd have the rock, we'd have the chamber, we'd have, you know, complete noise, free improv. It was very loud. It was very quiet. Yeah. I needed you guys for that. Um, 
and then the bass player could be more or less involved. I mean, it, it was almost like a thing where we needed a bass player to kind of hold things together and we could go off on our duo and trio improvisations. And, mm -hmm. but it, great bass players though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was like, and then eventually where it was Joel Hamilton, I wanted him to play electric and acoustic bass. Right. So it sort of came out in the open instead of trying to make a loud acoustic bass player you know, kind of like, well, we're going to go rock. Um, but I, I, something you said was interesting to me about playing with Nels is that you guys have to try not to play together. Or it's an, it's an effort of not trying to, to play what the other guy plays because you know what's, what he's going to play. Frequently, yeah. Uh, that's true. It's one of the reasons Nels started playing with different drummers in his groups, you know. Um, <clears throat> I have had other musicians where, excuse me, <clears throat> the rapport was kind of freaky that way. Um, Eric Von Essen was one of them, by the way. Um, and I seem to get that a lot with piano players for some reason. I've had some really amazing rapport with some piano players. But with Nels, yeah, I mean, one of the things that's undeniable is, A, we're twins. Actually, two things, I guess, that are undeniable. And B, we've been making not just making music together but making music out of you know basically nothing together because we just started playing together from early on you know not trying to like learn songs and do that so there's going to be a potential for some let's just say uh not maybe enough contrast <laughs> It just is what it is, I guess. Do you think that there's any sort of um, telepathy worth mentioning, or is it just that you have all the same reference points? Uh, it's hard to say. I don't know that it matters. Um, uh, but we, there have been uh, times when we've played something that was so bizarre that came seriously out of nowhere, like in, in the middle of, you know, say in one of Vinny's bands years ago, maybe but, you know, playing behind one of the horn soloists and then just playing some freakish accent at this exact same moment out of nowhere. You know, you have to wonder about stuff like that, I guess. Um, you know, there was one gig where famously Nels started a solo and then we went off into this completely different, seemingly unrelated musical direction from what the tune was, which fortunately in Vinny's music is totally allowable. Um, and it was almost this kind of like King Crimson, like, like throbbing buildup, you know, the, the reaching this frenzied peak. And then we just stopped at the same moment and went back into the swing time. <laughs> and Kim Richmond, who was playing the uh, alto saxophone on the gig, who was, had his back turned to the audience and was like looking at Nelson me this whole time. When this happened, he just looked at us both and he said, quite audibly it's like one mind you know so there are those things that do happen um but you know one of the beauties of improvisation is when these kind of magic moments happen and they happen in unexpected surprising ways and with sometimes with people you don't expect them to happen i've had some duo gigs with uh, pianist joshua white in the last couple of years where just tons of those kinds of freaky things happen. And I don't know what's going on, but you know, wow, it's fun. It's one of the reasons I still like to improvise because right. yeah, sure, you can always fall flat on your face, but when you're that in the moment and things like that happen and you're really both, or in, as a group committed to making music, you know, in other words, putting your ego over to the side and just, um, engaging in this sort of communion. I mean, it's just a profound experience sometimes. You know, I think a thing that, that maybe doesn't get spoken about enough though is the listening component. The well, listening, yeah. the You're listening right. to the other person, to the person listening to you, knowing the person's listening to you, knowing that the person knows you're listening to them. And then these other strategies emerge because then it's 
I could play with you, but I'm not going to for this moment, right? Yeah. So we, we have all these options of contrast. We have yeah. these options of if I change direction, will that person hear that and go with me? Right. Um, so I like to, to sometimes articulate this, particularly to my students, where uh, you, you forget how much listening is really the key to successful musical endeavor. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. And then while you're listening, you know, get out of your head. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, there's well, a, you listen to like, I feel like you're listening to a third thing then. You're listening to you, you're listening to the, the other person, persons, and then you're listening to that thing that's the result of the two of, or the group playing, and that's what you're serving. So you yeah. get out of yourself and you almost become in a, a part of a group mind. Right. Because it isn't like you stop thinking. I mean, you're still making choices, right? Your mind is still working, but it isn't trying to run the show. You know, it's not trying to be in charge. Um, so it's sort of like thinking and not thinking. Or, you know, there's a famous Charlie Parker quote that it goes something like, you know, you know, you study and practice and, you know, get your technique, your facility together, then you forget all that shit and play. You know, it's kind of like that. Um, I remember saying to John McLaughlin something like, you know, you sounded so great tonight. I love what you were playing. And he said to me, well, you know, Greg, I just try to stay out of the way. You know, of myself. Right. Right. And, um, and it's true that, you know, if you were to sit there and you know this, if you were to sit there and say, okay, I'm going to play this pattern on the ride cymbal and I'm going to play this thing on the hi-hat, I'm going to accent on these, you know, this triplet thing with my left hand. And then when, you know, this, after X number of quarter notes go by, I'm going to put in this bass drum thing. I mean, if you're that wrapped up in your head, you're never going to sound like anything. You know, yeah, and sometimes when we're developing an idea, like this happens with you and I a lot, it's like I'm developing an idea, and I feel like you or you know the possible outcomes of certain ideas that I will go with. Uh -huh. Also, you and I have a, a way of like co consistently of, uh, making subdivisions available. Yes. Right. Well, yeah. But that's you know, like I never learned any of that stuff academically, so this is. It, we can go back to just this for a moment, maybe. So much of my musical education came from, as you put it, you know, listening, using the ear. I just went to hear all these people, you know, and then I would just try to do what they were doing. And I would listen to these records, you know, endlessly. Um, you know, I remember when I first, one of the, the first Miles Davis record I think I ever bought, even though it wasn't the first one I ever heard, was Live Evil when it first came out. And I remember listening to Jack D. Jeanette. And similarly, though, when I first heard Tony Williams, which was before this, I couldn't understand what he was doing. But I just knew, well, I want to do that. Right. You know? um, and there wasn't anybody who could teach that to me. You know, there wasn't a teacher. I mean, I knew some of the teachers who were hip to that stuff, but they were teaching in this very scientific super compartmentalized, broken down into components, intellectual sort of way. Um, which, you know, you could see if you listen to Tony, you could do that. You could, you could open that uh, perspective on it endlessly and be endlessly fascinated and blown away. But that doesn't mean you're ever going to sound like that if you try to play like that. So I would just keep trying to play like that. And, you know, I'm sure there were times when I just absolutely sucked. You know, I mean, I remember trying to get my hi-hat foot to keep playing on quarter notes while doing all this other stuff. And for a while, it just, I sounded like a, a complete buffoon. But, you know, eventually you do it. And then you get into the whole body memory thing and, you, you know, things start functioning, moving up to and functioning at a, at a, a more advanced level that then you can build on. But, um, you know, I don't know what people do now because you have all of this very sophisticated and formulated sort of jazz education available. Um, when I was in, leaving high school and the high school big band experience and all that, 
there were very few options for people who wanted to pursue playing that kind of music. I mean, I wasn't a big band fan, by the way, but play jazz academically. There was very little, you know, I could go to, you know, like Berkeley and, or New England Conservatory. I could go to North Texas State. You know, if I wanted to stay out here, I would have had to go to Cal State Northridge because there was a big band there. Um, those are kind of your options, you know, if I wanted to go a different direction, I suppose I could have gone to Wesleyan or some of these places where I couldn't have afforded anyway. But, um, but I was an art major, first of all, so <laughs> that wasn't something I had planned for. Like Andy right. Partridge. Well, yeah, I guess a lot of people. A lot of guys. But, um, but sure. still, I don't know how people do it now. You know, I don't know how, except that I think ultimately it's, it always comes down to the same thing, which is if you can hear it, eventually you can play it if you work at it. You know, if you can't hear it, it's not going to happen. But, um, you know, now you have these guys who are playing these insane odd meter subdivision things and reading it and playing the crap out of it. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think I could do that. I mean, I would have to, to shed on that stuff for months, probably. Um, but things are happening. Same, you know, going to hear the LA Philharmonic and listening to that orchestra, which is now a younger orchestra's um, ability to play so-called new music compared to what it was, you know, 15 or 20 years ago. Well, it's, I mean, I remember... It's light years beyond. You know, but when Interzone got to the second record and we had Stuart Liebig on electric bass, and I was writing more and more complex stuff. I remember you guys really being pissed about it. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, I, you know, Stuart and Nels are, they, by their own admission, they would say they're not like, you know, readers, so to speak. Um, so there's probably a certain amount of uh, deer in the headlights potential there. Um, <clears throat> One thing I'll say is that uh, I've had, not on that, but I've had frustration in other musical contexts where it wasn't so much that the music itself was complex and challenging as the band leader, and I'm not talking about you, wanted to try to control everything too much, yeah. including the improvising. And that was almost always disastrous. That's you know? overwhelming. Well, and also just not fun, not satisfying, you know, you'd be a, even on a gig. I remember, you know, in one particular thing, we'd be headed in some direction and the band leader returned to the band and like yell at them what he wanted them to do, you know, and I always just wanted to say, shut up and let us play, you know, so that was a band. I that was, understand. you know, to be able to, <laughs> to say to you guys, as I think you'll remember, I mean, let's play this these particular passages accurately, but then we're going to do whatever we want. Uh, see, I don't remember this. Sorry. <laughs> how, how do you remember it? Um, I, 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 mean, I guess what I remember mostly is um, that when we recorded that music, that it, it was you know a lot to try to do it in one shot and i think everyone got exhausted and we had to keep pushing through and also recording in wayne's studio you know it wasn't particularly comfortable um it was just uh it felt kind of pressured you know i guess that's what it was but i don't remember the the musical discussion about the direction of the improvs or any of that stuff i'm afraid sorry it's well, there, there wasn't really it's gone it well, was you know, play this material, you'll know what to improvise on. Okay. I mean, that's well, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I, anything where you were playing, you know, these kind of really kind of more new music -y written things and then uh, open ended textural, etc., structures for improvisation, and then you're playing a Mahavishnu orchestra tune is fine with me. <laughs>
I can relate to that. Yeah, we um, did that. Yeah. Yeah, we did Sanctuary. But I feel in many ways, like the most well known of the, the, the trilogy was the Requiem for Jack Kirby, which is the third one. Right. Which in many ways is, you know, musically the most fun for me. Um, and also I wanted to say that when you described, you know, where you, you incorporate the strengths of the various players and their identities into your musical vision, that's the sign of a good band leader, as far as I'm concerned, in this kind of music. Um, obviously it's maybe different if you're, you know, fronting a rock band or something, I don't know. But this, for example, was one of the, uh, I mean, this is something obviously Julius did because he wouldn't even tell you, you know, he would just let you play. Um, although I, that said, I remember he was always trying to get Nels when Nels joined the job band too, <clears throat> to basically like, you know, loosen up and not worry so much about trying to sound like a convincing jazz guitarist. And it wasn't until we did the encore at our gig at this uh, Ville Sal Jazz Festival, which became the album Georgia Blue. The encore was Dogon AD. And it was kind of, it was a very long set. And then we played this encore. And because it just kind of didn't matter anymore, Nels took this completely like psychedelic guitar solo that you know it's really great but that julius was like do that you know don't don't hold back and, and you know what i was going to say is this was very much something i was always really aware of with tim Byrne. tim was a genius at getting people's musical identities to be plugged into and enhance his own musical ideas um and uh, therefore the individuals as, a, as players had a profound influence on the outcome of his, his music. Uh, somebody recently brought to my attention the, the Fulton Street Mall album again. And again, I sort of needle drop through it because you know, I, I never sit around listening to this stuff. And that was a record that was frustrating for me because it was shortly after my wrist injury thing and my chops were as my brother Nels would say, I didn't have chops, I had a chop. So it was really, really disappointing to me for that reason, but I was listening to what happens in it musically and it was like, you know, he heard that, you know, that Bill does that thing, I'm putting that there, I'm gonna let him do that there. Hank does that thing where he plays and uses his voice, we're gonna stick that in there. Alex does this thing where he just has all the like, you know, the quiet bells and gongs or the, the overtone singing or whatever. We're going to incorporate all of this singing bowls at the end of this, or, you know, put it all in there, you know, mix it up. You know, somebody described it was like, as their favorite acid jazz record of all time, you know, and I'm like, what is, is that what it is? Okay. Whatever. You know what I mean? Well, that's not what it was for you. No, it's, we were just being ourselves, you know, that was the thing. And plus that record was done, you know, I mean, we recorded it in, two days, mixed it in one or two days, I can't remember, and mastered it on the last day while, while they were all out here to record it. It was like done in five days, you know? When we went to CBS to get the budget, the vouchers and everything for the recording session, the woman at the, we all, Tim insisted that we all go, which I think is hilarious. So we all went to CBS in Century City and the woman looked at the budget and she said, are you guys recording a single? So that kind of tells the story. But it was, you know, that's still one of my favorite records I've ever done, even though my playing on it is, you know, it's hard for me to listen to. But, um, but part of the reason is what you're describing. It's being able to take these people's strong musical identities and use those to make the greater whole of one's own musical expression, you know? Well, I didn't hire you guys as, as sidemen. I hired you as collaborators. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. You know? Right. And, and even I'm uncomfortable saying hire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I called upon you to help me in my task, uh, you know, of trying to forge together some sort of, um, picture of my 
musical worlds. And, right. you know, I mean, I knew I could say, Alex, you know, gong intro, you got it. And then you could set the, 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 the table for us to come in and, you know, so there was so many different ways to approach the music, which I tried to do. And then I also knew, trusted, knew that you guys would uh, know exactly what it was. And we played live a lot. I mean, there was a, yeah. you know, that was particularly the first record. We had toured those tunes before we recorded them with Mark Tress. Yeah. Which I was, was just re reminded of how we did that, that gig at, uh, you know, the Ralph Waldo Emerson Unitarian Church building in Amherst. It's the one I think of the most for some reason. Yeah, me too. It's partly because of the venue. I mean, does it get more historic than that? <laughs> That's amazing, especially coming from California. It's like super novel. You know? Yeah. But I was going to say also, before we you know sign off, which I guess we're going to have to do here at some point, um, <clears throat> the fact that you, for example, expressed your appreciation for the Alex Klein ensemble stuff because of that sort of vast uh, range of influences that inform the music. Um, there aren't that many people in the world who have that perspective. So, you know, uh, frequently one of the th difficulties in getting that music across to the general music listening public is the fact that, you know, for people who like more intense out music, it was, you know, far too lyrical, pretty, and, and uh, ethereal. And for people who like lyrical, pretty, and ethereal, it would get too chaotic and intense and uh, dissonant, right? Um, so to have it all in one place is almost a sure recipe for disaster for, in some ways, you know? Um, and moving into more recent times, you know, doing that uh, reimagining I did of the Peace, People and Sorrow by Roscoe Mitchell, you know, <clears throat> okay, that's, Kind of, you have to say, that's avant-garde jazz, right? To me, it's just, you know, it's just what it is. It's a, it's a musical expression. You know, then when I went on and did Oceans of Vows with the large group, that's all music I composed, and it's almost all tonal. Right. You know? But it's weird. I just, you know, I realized that I don't necessarily think very much in those terms. And this is something I felt was true with Interzone. You know, tonal, atonal, rhythmic, arrhythmic, textural, you know, uh, intense, ethereal, whatever. You know, it's all music and it's all part of the vocabulary to express something. Um, you know, I think that Requiem for Jack Kirby also, I have to say, it's fair to say, got more attention because of the album art um, and I only mention this because I also wanted to say that as somebody who is a dinosaur and grew up in the era of artifacts I miss this a lot um, you know one of the beauties of Requiem for Jack Kirby is what it is what it uh, what exists as an artifact you know it's a real artifact oh my god so I value that, you know, Oceans of Vows. I remember when it came out, it was like already everyone's telling me, you know, people don't buy this stuff anymore. And I was like, I don't care if this could be the last thing I ever do. I don't know. I never know. Everything I've ever done of my own music, I've done with the, the uh, in the back of my mind, the idea that, you know, this could be the last thing I ever record. Oh, for it's sure. Enormous, right. We don't know. And as I've said to people about Oceans of Vows, I just said, well, look, here, I'm going to give this to you. If you never listen to CDs anymore, it's okay. Enjoy the package because, you know, it looks really nice. Um, so even if you don't like the music, enjoy the artifact. Well, know? I mean, obviously, artifacts usually important over here. But, you know, the fact that we, we really care about the entire package of the thing. So when right. we hand you this thing, now we don't hand it, we press a button, but when we handed you this thing, you yeah. wanted it to be beautiful. Right. You wanted it to be special, you wanted it to be unique, you wanted it to be 
its own universe. And that's where I think you and I have, have really connected is that, you know, we realize like not only just are we our own universes musically, but every piece is its own yeah. universe. And yeah, that's the mantra that I have, that if I'm producing someone else's music, every one of their pieces is its own universe. Yeah, well, and I've been really deeply fortunate because I've been able to make some artifacts that were exactly what I wanted to do, the right. way I wanted to do them. And, you know, this also brings into mind the whole, the whole ECM thing. I mean, they, that changed the whole graphics thing in a major way. Similarly, <clears throat> I, I think of David Sylvian, for example. I mean, David Sylvian is somebody who is an artist I really love. But, you know, this is somebody who clearly had his, put his fingerprints on every aspect of his artifact production. You know, the visuals, the audio, the whole presentation was cranked up to one level of importance you know this is right. all important and that's something that i miss because you know now that everything is basically just like a digital download and we're, we've basically gone back to the era of 45s where you know it's like people are interested in songs not albums as somebody who was who lived through and was damaged by the appearance of things like Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band when I was, however, 11 years old or whatever, and, you know, bought it the first week it came out after hearing these songs on the radio and just being, you know, blown away. You know, that changed that whole world, but that world is now disappearing. And Or even uh, Trout Mask. Yes. Well, another record that was huge for me and all those early mother's records, but Trout Mask Replica, for sure. You know, none of my friends would listen to it with me, but, you know, that was huge for me. But it's also, that was a visual buy. Yeah. I mean, if you hadn't heard it before, you go, well, who are these guys? Yeah, you know? right. I, I well, recently interviewed Harkle Road, you know, for the podcast, and I showed him pictures from the photo shoot that weren't on the album that got reissued late. Uh -huh. It was just like, yeah, it was, we were presenting a visual world along yeah. with our, our sound, sonic world. Right. And then, of course, you know, Frank Zappa satirizing Sgt. Pepper's with We're Only In It For The Money. And all of that, I mean, people forget that album art was not important until around that period, you know, when everything changed. You know, I did an, uh, one of the oral history interviews I did many years ago is with John Van Hammersfeld, who was one of these people who has designed countless, well, he's basically kind of a, one of the iconographers of my entire growing up in Southern California. I mean, starting with his design for the, the poster for the film, The Endless Summer, right? And then designing famous album covers, right? Magical Mystery Tour, Crown of Creation, Exile on Main Street, you know, these things. None of that could have happened if artists hadn't completely decided that we were, we were going to take this aspect of making a full full-on artifact seriously and um you know just like all the improvis improvisation that what that i was listening to just like all of these different musics we've been talking about that was part of the thing that had a big impact on the, my life and on the way i think about things and the way i do uh I do things, but I, I have to confess that I'm aware of the fact that it's, you know, on the verge of being extinct. Just like right now, we're on the, we're pretty much living in an era where the truth is one of the most endangered species um, that we're living with. But anyway, I don't want to end on a sour note, but I'm going to have to, uh, blast off here in a moment yeah i mean and, you know and, and just before we split i know that that we both had a a sort of relationship with the comic book as an artifact uh -huh. now, that world you know the visual world mad magazine even even uh a package that i still have in my house from you of all the old sci-fi uh little paperbacks with those yeah. covers i can't get rid of those i want <laughs> you got rid of them to give them to me 
And I yeah. couldn't get rid of them because I look at the covers. And it's fascinating because one, uh, Andy Partridge recently did a box set of pieces inspired by those sci-fi covers. Wow. You know? Here's something that might blow your mind. Are you familiar, because you do fantasy too, right? Not just science fiction. Oh yeah. Are you familiar with the Peter Jackson books? Yes. Okay, you know the covers, the cover paintings mm -hmm. are by a guy named John Rocco? Ron Rocco, I didn't know the name, yeah. Okay, well, up until like a year ago, for at least five years, he was the guy renting the house I grew up in. Oh. So, for example, my daughter, Xinwan, has, you know, a signed uh, piece of artwork by him. Um, yeah. So he would be sitting in one at what used to be, you know, my house, painting that stuff. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, he's back on the East Coast somewhere now. Alex, we could go for hours. Every single topic could be at least one or two hours for sure. But before we do... Uh, say goodbye. Anything you want to plug? Anything you want to tell us about that's happening? The Alex Klein music. <laughs> well, here in the COVID era, you know, of course, all my gigs got canceled, and there's nothing at all planned. Um, but <clears throat> one thing I guess I can mention. I don't know the details. I don't know where it's at right now. But uh, a concert I did last December at the Mr. Music Head Gallery as part of a series that goes on there uh, presented by Just Jazz, which is uh, in the person of the wonderful Leroy Downs, a uh, local jazz disc jockey and presenter of music. Uh, the recording of that concert is supposed to be released digitally via Just Jazz. They're starting to release recordings of some of the concerts and I don't know when this is going to actually manifest, but it has been mixed. Um, it seemed, it sounds really good from what I can tell. And uh, that was a, a group doing a completely free improvisation that featured Eric Barber on tenor and soprano saxophone, uh, Joshua White on piano, Michael Gregory Jackson, somebody whom I met back in 1976 when he was here in LA playing duo with Oliver Lake on electric guitar. Um, and a young bassist named Miller Wren, uh, the group called the Upeksha Ensemble. So that's the one thing I know for sure is going to be released other than I know pianist Tom McDonough is getting to release a bunch of stuff from his tours on Bandcamp. And some of that is music we did as a duo and as a, an ensemble uh, here at the Blue Whale uh, and a year or two ago, can't remember now. Um, he just recently informed me that he's gonna be releasing some of that stuff. Uh, I've heard the, the duo thing because there's a YouTube video of that uh, posted, but the the group stuff I haven't even heard. I just said, sure, you know, put it out. What the heck? Um, and you know, there's so much that that I've done over the years that doesn't that didn't wind up getting documented or doesn't get wind up getting uh, released. But there is also going to be uh, a box set of unreleased compositions by Julius Hemphill, and it's on New World Records. And um, apparently I'm, I'm on maybe like five tracks. And so the trio with Baikita, a couple of tracks from that record that never came out, oh. recorded in 1977. Um, <clears throat> some live stuff with the, the quartet with Abdul. So from the Foxhole in Philadelphia, something from that. Uh, a job band track oh. um, from the last tour. I'm afraid to hear it because of that. The, the crippled tour. And then um, uh, I think also a track, yes, a track from a quintet gig that Julius did here in LA in 1978. So that's with, with me and Baikita with the addition of Roberto Miranda on bass and Julius's former high school music teacher, John Carter on clarinet. 
I didn't ever know that he was a student of Carter. That's interesting. Julius was a senior when, I believe, when John was on his first teaching job at a high school in Fort Worth, Texas. And Julius told me they made merciless fun of John all the time. Why? Oh, because he was, he seemed so square and academic. <laughs> <clears throat> and Julius was basically totally focused on football at that time in his life, you know. But, um, so that was quite an experience just to be with Julius and John in this setting many years later it was just really quite extraordinary. But, but anyway, so a bunch of tracks on that and there's a bunch of other stuff on it too. I don't know what, but, uh, whenever that comes out, you can, you can look for that and, you know, it, it, if, well, if nothing else, remind people that, you know, I was, I actually freakish, freakishly have been doing this that long, but, but hopefully mostly will uh, introduce people or remind people of the brilliance of Julius. Um, you asked me earlier about, you know, how he worked with his music and I'll end with this story. This is typical Julius. This happened when we were on our way to record the trio album in New York in December of 77. And when we were on tour as a trio, um, <clears throat> one radio show we did in Brussels, he would just, um, just pull out music paper and start writing. So when we were in the, in the van on the way to the studio in New York, he just pulled out some music paper and started writing and just wrote this little theme. And then that became something we not only recorded, but we opened every concert with this. But he got tired of playing the same material. So when we did this show in, in this radio show in Brussels, which was like an hour of music, he just showed up with a whole bunch of music that apparently he had written the day before. And he just said, I want to play this. I'm tired of playing that other stuff. So we played this music. I don't remember what it was. I never heard it back. Someone, I hope, has a recording of it somewhere in an archive in Brussels at the radio station. But, you know, it's music that, as far as I know, was only played once. And that was the way he was. He was totally unnatural in that way. He would just sit down and write a bunch of stuff, and then everyone would have to learn how to play it, which sometimes for people like Baikita was arduous and difficult stuff. But, um, you know, I guess I can finish by saying I've just been incredibly fortunate to be able to make music with people I believe to be true musical geniuses. And Julius was one, you know, Eric Von Essen was another. Um, you know, there are others, there are many, John Carter. I mean, we've lost these people, but their music lives on, thankfully. Well, then while you're here, I'm going to tell you that making music with you has been a highlight of my life. Well, thank you. I've had many musical highlights. I'm blessed that way. Seriously, I, I, I wouldn't be able to, to like enumerate them. Um, and they're still happening, you know. Yeah. I've, had, I've had many a, many a highlight and um, you know, it doesn't even it doesn't even matter if anyone knows. You know, I remember reading in a in the writings of of filmmaker one of my heroes Andrei Tarkovsky. You know, one of the things he said, and I'll have to paraphrase, is that the creative act makes a difference in the world, no matter if anyone ever sees, hears, or knows about it. And I have to believe that. I believe it. Yeah. So we keep doing it. Yeah. Anyway. I mean, I hope, I hope we'll get to do it again uh, soon, Alex. You know, uh, we hadn't played a while uh, for a while when we did my 50th birthday concert. The, the craziest gigs ever. <laughs> Come on. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the craziest at the baked potato. Oh, I'm sure. I don't think there's any argument there. <laughs> 
Well, you, you can't speak to it because you are not a regular of the potato. But I got, I got you in there. So, so you could be part of that. But no, that was, uh, and then again, we, we opened the concert as a duo. Right. And, uh, and it was like no time had passed and we were immediately playing rhythmic unisons and modulating and, and I look forward to more of that, buddy. I, I hope <laughs> that we can get through all this crap and be yeah. able to play again and make music again and share music. Um, such a pleasure to talk to you always. Thank so you. much information. Uh, we're going to try to get this under three hours here. But, okay. uh, but thank you, Alex. Alex. Everybody, thank you for watching. Um, more to come. Please like and subscribe to the podcast. We're on YouTube. We're on Facebook. And we will be elsewhere. And uh, go out and, and, and buy some Alex Klein online and, and, and listen to his music. And your life will be better for it. So thank yeah, you. Alex. My presence on social media is pretty minimal. So yes, please enjoy whatever you can find. Um, and cryptogramophone. Cryptogramophone. I'm, yeah, I'm, ter I'm terrible about, I mean, I don't do Facebook and I'm just terrible about this stuff. I think I'm going to have to get better now that I've retired from my day job. But something to do. Um, hmm? It'll give you something to do. Yeah, but I see I rely on people like you who are really more fully engaged to kind of, you know, get things moving. So thank you for that. Thank you for asking me. And again, for anyone who's watching this, you know, even if it's like three people, thank you for hanging in there. I hope that there is something in it that was interesting or even inspiring for you. And I urge you to enjoy all of Mr. Bendian's, not just uh, prog casts, but musical manifestations, which again, you know, they run the full gamut of musical expression, all of which are legitimate and worthwhile. So enjoy. Alex Klein, five from Greg Bendian. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Greg.